Love the second song that we did in the worship set this morning. If you're a follower of Jesus, you're on a journey. And it's a journey to a home that none of us have ever seen before. But Paul tells us that while no eye has seen and no ear has heard, no mind has even been able to imagine the great things that God has in store for those who love him, we believe it. But for now, Jesus says the kingdom of God is within you. He's there by the presence of his spirit that was given to you when you put your faith in Christ. But here in America today, we are more divided as a nation than we have been at any time in our history since the Civil War. People who outwardly proclaim tolerance in this culture are openly hating others who don't believe as they believe. And others who believe that the country's been headed in the wrong direction and, and think that they have finally been proved right, now things will get back to the way they ought to be. Beware of false pride. Both sides marginalize each other. Neither seems willing to listen to one another who don't share their views. There's little respect. Some people are openly declaring that the president-elect is not their president, and others are ready to go out and buy bus tickets to Mexico or to Canada for those who don't want this president inaugurated. So what's the answer for a nation where distrust, self-centeredness, and hatred seem to be in control? Listen to the words of Jesus as he describes what the end times will look like. He says, at that time, many will turn away from the faith and will betray and hate each other, and many false prophets will appear and deceive many people. Because of this increase in wickedness, the love of most will grow cold. But he who stands firm to the end will be saved. We should not be surprised. We should not be caught off guard by the circumstances that we find this country in today. This morning, we begin our celebration of Advent and our focus is on the incomparable agape love of God that has the ability to change everything. His love takes impossible people and it takes impossible circumstances and it changes them to possible. When the angel appears to Mary to announce that she would be the mother of the long-promised Messiah, he says to her, for nothing, nothing shall be impossible for God. Mary was just still a teenager. She was engaged to Joseph, but the marriage had not yet been consummated. It would have been a scandal for her in the little town of Nazareth to be pregnant before the marriage was consummated. But Mary's response is one of faith. She says to the angel, may it be to me as you have said. This is a statement that believes that with God, all things are possible. It might have been a strange way to save the world, but Mary trusted God and was yielded to his purpose in her life. Do you hear that? Mary trusted God, and she was yielded to him for his purpose in her life. This morning, the Advent love candle was lit. So I want to spend a few moments with you together understanding how this great, incomparable, agape love of God impacts everything in a fallen world full of selfish, self-centered people. I'm going to look at four things with you this morning. First, we're going to look at the radical nature of God's love. Then we're going to look at how one life changed by the love of God saved many others. And then we're going to look at how God's love is the answer for what ails us today. 
And finally, we're going to ask ourselves the question, how is the love of God transforming my life? That's the question that Daniel raised. It's a great question. Each one of us needs to ask it. God's love does change things, and Jesus is what God's love looks like. In Colossians 1.15, Paul says, Jesus is the image of the invisible God. The one who come and took on flesh, Hebrews says, he is the exact representation of God. So what we have is God in the flesh, and that God full of love is showing us what love looks like. And and I want to go through just a, a few key points of what love looks like because very often Jesus gets painted as kind of a weak, sometimes even a feminine kind of guy. He was neither of those. Let me tell you what his love looked like. First, it was strong and courageous. Pastor Charlie has preached out of Joshua in the past, and he, and he loves the verse where God says to Joshua multiple times, be strong and courageous. That's what love is. Love is strong and courageous. How do we know that? Because love is able to take rejection. Love is able to handle humiliation. Love is able to bear up under persecution. Love is compassionate. It's moved to meet people at their point of need. When Jesus, by the Spirit of God, came to you and called you into his kingdom, it was out of his great compassion for you. He met you at your point of need. Love is forgiving. And it not only forgives its friends, it chooses to forgive its enemies. Love is humble. The creator of the universe, the owner of everything in it, humbled himself to come and put on flesh and lay down his life for us. Love is kind. The word means to be benevolent towards others. When it sees a need, it reaches out to meet the need wherever it might be. Love serves. Jesus comes as a different kind of leader. He takes the world's leadership model and he turns it on its head. And he says, the one to whom everybody owes everything will serve all. And love is focused on its mission. You heard it read, but I'll read it again. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn it, but through him to save it. Apart from God, people love people who love them. But God's love is radically different. God's love loves even those who are his enemies. I want to drop back. We've just finished our study in the book of Romans. I want to drop back to three things that Paul says about love in the book of Romans. Number one, love is a choice and not an emotion. Romans 5, 6 through 8 says, You see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous man, though for a good man someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. You and I, believe it or not, were not lovable at all. You and I were God's enemies, but God chose to love us and to bring us into his great family. Second, nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. Listen to Paul's ringing declaration in Romans 8. It nearly jumps off the page. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? 
shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword. No, in all of these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither life nor death neither angels nor demons, neither present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. His great love cannot be taken from you. It's greater than all your weaknesses it's greater than all of our shortcomings. It's greater than all of the circumstances that you face in your life today and right on up till the time when we stand in his presence. God's love changes, number three, what we believe and how we act toward others. What we believe and how we act towards others. Listen to what Paul says in chapter 12 of Romans. First, love brings a bond of devotion to one another. That's Romans 12:10. And he continues in that verse and he says, and love leads us actually to put others ahead of ourselves. Love teaches us to be patient when we are under affliction, that's Romans 12.12. 12. Love is generous and it shares with others as there is need, that's Romans 12.13. Love leads us to live together here in the body of Christ in harmony, not allowing our differences to divide us, that's Romans 12.16. Love chooses to reconcile with others as much as it's up to us. You don't control what anyone else can do. All you can do is control yourself in the power of the Holy Spirit, and desire to be reconciled wherever there's broken relationship. That's Romans 12, 18. And love teaches us to avoid getting even with others, even to avoid justifying our own actions before others, but it teaches us to do good to our enemies. That's Romans 12, 20. Paul is telling us, that God love, God's love changes us. And God's love can change even things that happen in war. Recently, a group of us went to see the movie Hacksaw Ridge. And I read this review in Christianity Today, and there's a couple of their quotes I want to give to you because it, it will help focus us around this Question, coming as it does a few days, they say, before the most divisive U.S. presidential election in recent memory, Hacksaw Ridge ponders a timely question. How can we live alongside one another amidst differences, bearing with and respecting one another's convictions, even when we vehemently disagree? In this congregation, there are those that were on this side and there were those that were on that side. These are things that divide us and we vehemently can disagree with one another. The article continued, this is where the rubber meets the road in religious liberty debates. Pluralism is all well and good when a to each their own ethos allows people to do their thing in the privacy of their own homes and communities. It's when one's personal expression has implications on others that it becomes a problem. What happens when a man's religious convictions conflict with his call of duty in war? What happens when an individual's conscience has consequences for others, as in soldiers fighting alongside a gunless Desmond Doss in battle. Desmond Doss was a poor boy from the Blue Ridge of Virginia. He was raised Seventh-day Adventist. And at a very early age, he was impacted deeply by a picture that his parents had put up on the wall. It had the Ten Commandments on it, and it had various depictions of things around those commandments. And the one that stuck out to him was Thou shalt not kill. And the picture was Cain slaying Abel. 
And Desmond Doss, as a boy, decided he would honor God by never taking a life. But as Desmond Doss grew up, there came an event he couldn't get away from. It was called Pearl Harbor. And suddenly America was at war. And he was also convinced and convicted that he needed to serve. How could a conscientious objector, one who had said, I will never take life, serve in the armed forces of the United States? He determined that he would become a medic, that he would attempt to save lives and not take them. The unit that Desmond Doss trained with and was attached to was going to be sent to the Pacific. The war in the Pacific was particularly brutal. The Japanese had begun to target U.S. medics. You see, they, they wore helmets that had a white circle and a red cross in them. They were easily identified on the battlefield. That was so that, hopefully, soldiers would not target them, but they were being targeted. And so the medics in the Pacific began to wear regular helmets without the cross on them and to carry weapons for the first time into combat so that they could not only protect themselves, but as they were treating the wounded, they could also protect them. Desmond Doss refused to take training with weapons. He refused to go out on the rifle range and qualify. He refused to carry a weapon. As a result, his commanding officers and his peer soldiers wanted him out of the unit. They began to persecute them. They called him coward. They didn't want him with them. But the United States Constitution protected conscientious objectors. And he was allowed to go to war with his outfit into the Pacific and not carry a gun. He actually fought in three campaigns, the battle at Guam, a battle in the Philippines, and the last battle of the war at Okinawa, which was the most brutal fighting of that entire war. There was a place that the Americans nicknamed Hacksaw Ridge. It was actually an escarpment. They, they had to go take it. They had to climb the escarpment. They had to go get rope ladders from the ships that they had climbed down into the landing craft, bring those ropes ashore, and get them up the side of the cliff so that they could go take it. Several times, American units had gone up. Several times, they'd been pushed back off with heavy casualties. And finally, Doss's battalion was called to take their turn in the meat grinder. They went up, and initially, they were successful. But a Japanese counterattack pushed them off the ridge. And those that were able got back down. One man chose to stay behind. His name was Desmond Doss. You see, there were lots of wounded men laying on the ground that couldn't get to the ropes and get down. And over the next day or so, this man is credited with having taken 75 men, treated them immediately for their wounds, carried them to the edge of the escarpment, and lowered them down so they could get medical care. 75. He had determined he wasn't there to take life. He was there to save it. Oh, by the way, one of the men that he saved was the captain of his company, who had called him a coward, who had tried to run him out of the unit, who had personally persecuted him. I saw a film from a This Is Your Life, an old 50s TV series, and they did Desmond Doss's uh, life, and the captain came out, and he said, Desmond Doss saved my life. I'm here today because of him. This is what God's love looks like in action. It's not weak. It may look weak at times, but it is not weak. Doss, by the way, was awarded the highest honor anyone in our military can be given. The only conscientious objector ever to be given the Congressional Medal of Honor. 
Both the beliefs and the actions of Desmond Doss reflect what the great love of God looks like as it's lived out by the followers of Jesus. He was called a coward, pressured to quit. He endured the persecution of those who saw courage differently. But in the middle of combat, without weapons to defend himself, Doss continued to risk his own life to save his fellow soldiers. One more story about Desmond Doss. When the Americans came back up, he was wounded. They put him on a stretcher and they were carrying him to the edge of the escarpment. And they went by a soldier that was more seriously wounded than he was. He asked them to stop. He rolled off of the stretcher. He crawled over and he treated the man. And he said, you take him. And they did. And he crawled to the edge of the escarpment himself. That's what love does. That's what love looks like. This simple man of conviction believed and he lived out Jesus' command to love each other and love our enemies. Desmond Doss understood that love risks being hurt and he understood that love is willing to lay down its life for its friends and even lay it down for its enemies. God's love changes our lives today and I want to look at two ways it does that. First, as we learn and practice loving one another as he loves us. Two of my favorite verses, John 13, 34 and 35, say this. This is Jesus speaking. A new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this all men will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Jesus felt so strongly about this issue of love in the life of his followers that he places it in the form of a commandment to them. In my study of the scripture, it's the only time that I'm aware of that Jesus made a commandment here on earth. Most of the commandments were given through in the Old Testament, but here he commands his disciples, and three times he says to them, love one another. Our identity as followers of Jesus is shown by the way that we love each other. They'll know who you are by the way that you love each other. And God even chooses for others to see Jesus and his great love through the way that we love one another. If what Daniel says is true, if we love one another more deeply than we did last year, Trust me, the Holy Spirit will bring people here into this congregation because he wants them to see that and know that and be a part of that. That's part of our vision for the year coming up. This community of followers of Jesus is to put aside the things that easily divide us. Our political positions, race, gender, economic position, age, whatever we do to earn a living, and any other divisive practice that can be stated amongst us, we're to focus on what unites us, and what unites us is the great love of God in Christ Jesus. And it calls us into unity with one another and into the community of Christ. The cross, as Pastor Charlie has said in the, some of his last sermons in Romans, is where we come together. And dear ones, the cross is the greatest emblem of the love of God. It's why ultimately the church picked it up. Because it identifies how great God's love was for us. The second thing that God's love changes us is, is as we learn and practice loving our enemies. Jesus said this to his followers, love your enemies, do good to those who, listen, hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. Love may look weak, but in the end, love triumphs. It triumphed in Jesus' life, 
It triumphed in the life of Desmond Doss, and it has triumphed in the life of followers of Jesus, millions of them over the centuries since he walked the earth. Often we're faced with obstacles, usually in the form of people. And our flesh wants to hold on to unforgiveness. It wants to justify ourselves in treating others just like they treated us. It wants to refuse to love those who have injured us. We want to be proven right in circumstances. These reactions are of our flesh. They have nothing to do with the great love of God who laid down his life for each of us when we were still his enemies. By loving our enemies, we show how the great love of God really looks. Jesus said, freely you have received. You received the love of God when you didn't earn it, deserve it, or merit it. God simply chose to pour it out on you. He says, freely you have received, therefore freely give. He wants you to become the vessel of his great love so that others might see him and know him and come to follow him as well. There's power to love as Jesus loves. Peter said this, his divine power has given us everything we need for life and godliness through our knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. What's that power look like? We have the spirit within us. The spirit is the spirit of love. That love has been placed in you, and it needs simply to be activated within you, a cooperation on your part. We have the word of God. I read from you from Romans, and I described some of the things that Paul talks about. The spirit-inspired word of God has been given to us that we might know the mind and the heart of God and that we might know how that is to change the way we live, and most especially here within this community of faith. And we have one another. We are here to encourage and strengthen and build one another up. We're never called to tear one another down. This is how the love of God operates powerfully in our lives. Michael, if you'll come, please. So how do we live out this radical love of God in our lives today? Let me share six ideas with you. Number one, Discover how we are to live through God's word. I said the spirit inspired the word. This was not simply human authors. This is the spirit working in and through their lives. This is God's message to us as his people. It calls us into the ways that we are to live. It gives us what we need to know. And you and I need to be in it on a regular daily basis so that we are less influenced by what's going on in the culture around us and more influenced by the truth of God's word. Number two, ask. Ask that he would build his love in you. Isn't that what you said, Daniel, a little bit earlier? You see, asking, Jesus says, ask and you will receive. And I promise you, if you ask for him to build more of his love in you, that is dead center in the heart of God. He will absolutely do that in your life. And your life will never look the same again. Ask. Number three, yield to the direction of the Spirit of God in your life. We live in a noisy culture, a busy culture, and our lives become noisy and busy. And when they're so noisy and busy, we don't have ears to hear the quiet voice of the Spirit of God moving within us. We need to yield ourselves, be quiet. The Lord says, be still and know that I am God. We need to yield ourselves before his mighty hand so that he's able to direct us. He'll take us into situations that he's prepared for us in advance.
yielded. Discover, ask, yield. Four is repent. If you have refused to give love to others, you've been headed in this direction. God says repent. What that word means is you take a 180 and you turn in your life and you're turning back to God and you're bringing before him the confession. He already knows it. He wants you to be aware of it. He wants you to bring it to him and turn from it. Repentance is not preached on a lot. Repentance is important in the life of every believer. When we find that we've not been moving with the Spirit of God, repentance is what's called for. Number five, forgive. Are there people in your life that have injured you, wounded you, hurt you, and you have not been willing and able to forgive them? Forgiveness is the greatest act of love. God calls us by forgiving us and then calls us into a life of forgiving others. And oh, by the way, you have also hurt others. Where you have hurt others, then you may need to go and ask for forgiveness. Some of the most powerful words in the English language is, I am sorry, I was wrong, please forgive me comes from the heart, that's God at work, and he can take it and use it, not only in your own life, but in the life of the other person where there's broken relationship. And last, look. Look for opportunities to serve others. That's how love expresses itself. The creator of the universe, the owner of everything, humbled himself to come, put on flesh, and do what? Be a great king? He came to serve. And he calls you and I into his service. He says, follow me. Come, follow me. Serve others. The healing of a nation, dear ones, begins with one step of love at a time. Love one another as Jesus has loved you. Love your enemies, forgiving them by remembering that you were once an enemy of God and he chose to forgive you and he loves you dearly. I took a little license. I love that section of Romans 8 that I read to you earlier, but I wanted to bring it into focus in terms of possible love, the the focus of this message in the Advent season. And I want you to repeat this with me. Let's say it. What can separate us from loving one another as Christ loves us? Shall political positions, economic status, race, gender, high or low position, great or limited power? No. In all of these, we are more than conquerors through him who loves us and calls us to love each other. For I am convinced that neither liberal nor conservative, Republican, Democrat, or independent, nor current or future political circumstances, nor wealth or poverty, neither a wall with Mexico or no wall, nor anything else in all of creation can separate us from loving each other and loving our enemies as Christ loves us. If you'll bow your heads, I want to pray for you as we end this service. Father, show us if there's anything blocking our loving others as Jesus loves us. Please continue the good work that Jesus has begun in our lives so that what we believe and how we treat others would line up with your great love. May we truly love each other as Jesus loves us, and we ask that you would build us up in your love so that we would also love our enemies, that we bless those who curse us, that we do good to those who hate us, pray for those who mistreat us so that your love would shine through your people 
like the noonday sun. And we ask these things in the name of the great Lord and Savior of our soul, Jesus Christ, and the sons and daughters of God said together, amen. If you'll stand. We call this the pastoral blessing, but it is really the Lord's blessing into your life. When Pastor Charlie is here and I'm in the congregation as a worshiper, I hold out my hands to receive it and I would encourage you to do the same for this is for you today. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord cause his face to shine on you, be gracious unto you, and give you peace. In your rising up and in your lying down, in your going out, and in your coming in, both now and forever. Amen.